Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our breakout session, How to Ask a Woman to Run for Office. I'm excited to be joined by Jean Sedak and Mercedes Blackwood for what I know will be a very engaging and informative conversation. So ladies, let's begin. Um, the first question I have, um, Jean, I'll pose it to you first. Why do you think women are more likely to doubt their qualifications um, when considering running for office? Yes, and thank you, Tiffany, for moderating. Um, it's great to be with all of you. Um, well, you know, I mean, these these institutions, political institutions and political processes are historically unwelcoming to women, right? So, you know, when women candidates or potential candidates are making the choice to run, there are larger forces that influence all of those decisions. And right now there are processes and structures in place that make it hard um, and affect women's confidence for all kinds of reasons. And when I think of it, it's not just mental confidence, sort of innate, you know, judging your own qualifications, but it's also about like logistical confidence. Um, you know, can I, can I pull this off? Um, in my family? Um, will I get the support that I need? Um, and so on. And um, just bear with me for one second. I think I'm losing power. Sorry about that. No problem. My mistake. I had the wrong thing plugged in. So um, big no-no. Um, but so, you know, you know, we know that women are less likely to, so when I say processes and other things that affect their confidence, we know they're less likely to be recruited to run for office by political party leaders, other elected officials, and so on. Um, so there's that factor. It's like process, you know, a process that's a barrier for them. We also know that women um, are more likely to hold lower wage jobs. They're more likely to have jobs that don't give them flexibility to think about running for office. And running for office is time consuming and expensive. Um, they're more likely to be caregivers at home. They're still disproportionately you know, bearing the burden for that. We also know that bias against women candidates is real. Um, and then you layer on top of all of that, there's a lack of role models. Um, we're seeing that change as more and more women are entering um, politics and more diverse groups of women um, are entering politics, but it's still hard to find people who look like you and have the same background as you. And that can be something that influences your factor. So I think that all of these things, constellation of issues that make it harder for women um, to see themselves as viable candidates, even though you know we certainly know they are. That's awesome. Thank you, Jean. You know, Jean spoke about the, as she said, and I like that, the constellation of factors, everything from familial, personal to um, to the party leaders and party bosses. I know, Mercedes, you work quite a bit with um, right leaning and center right women. Do you find that also to be the case in your work as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just real quick, thank you all for having me today. Um, I work for the Women's Public Leadership Network, um, which is a nonpartisan, not profit organization dedicating to increasing the number of center right leaning women in office. So when I refer to WPLN um, in my responses, um, that's where I'm referring to. So when we're talking about the doubt, um, women doubting their qualifications, the truth is that women have always been interested in policies that impact their lives, their families, their communities, but women all too often face daily obstacles um, as they typically run point in their households and juggle the day-to-day -day demands of work. Um, additionally, there's been a lack of adequate and meaningful resources provided to women to equip them for the campaign trail and help them address barriers to running for office, um, recognizing that women from different um, backgrounds may encounter different uh, struggles during their candidacy. Um, so while it's true that female candidates are seeing more groups um, offering support and there's increased interest and excitement around having um, women of diverse backgrounds at the decision making table, there still are gaps and resources available to women, particularly women um, who are center and right leaning. Um, and we counter that at WPLN by offering tools and opportunities designed to equip women with the knowledge and resources they need um, to support their campaigns and uh, fulfill their respective missions. That's awesome. Um, and you talked a bit, Mercedes, about um, the policy that impact women, right? And the importance and sort of inherent in that was the importance in women being at the table um, because these policies impact them. And this is a little bit of a leading question, but I'm going to ask sort of the, the, the obvious question. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that more women are in public office? Sure. Are, well, is it, first, I should say, is this an issue? And if it is, why? Absolutely. Um, women remain vastly underrepresented in all levels of political leadership and decision-making roles 
across the United States. Um, though we know that a thriving, functioning democracy is dependent on diverse voices, including women of all backgrounds, uh, to ensure sound, reflective policies that produce better outcomes for all Americans. Um, so identifying and supporting a woman in your network that you think would make a great candidate for public office um, is oftentimes what will help that woman cross the first hurdle in considering a run for office, um, which is what we're talking about today and how to adequately ask a woman to run um, and feeding into that narrative of why it's important to have uh, more women at the decision-making table. And I'm going to pose the same question to you, Jean. Why, why is this an issue to have more women at the table or the lack of women at the table? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think Mercedes hit the nail on the head. I mean, and, and there's this fundamental fairness question that you want government to look like the people it serves. So right. we want diversity in all kinds of ways, by gender, by race and ethnicity, by socioeconomic status and so on. So right now we don't have that. We have pretty, you know, relatively homogenous um, elected across all levels of office um, nationwide. You know, Mercedes said women are still underrepresented about nationwide at all levels of office men hold about seven out of ten, every 10 seats you know and so that's a real problem there are life experiences that are not being addressed um perspectives that are not at the table and um you know so it's important that we get more women at those at those policy making tables we also know that women legislators do change the process they are more likely to make government more transparent um more likely to build consensus across the aisle Although I think that's getting harder and harder these days, um, but you know we're working towards that, right? We want to we want to get back to um, a place of building consensus, um, and you know more likely to bring marginalized groups and underrepresented voices to the table. So it's really important they they change the process and the policies. I, I love what you both have said, and and, and in my role as CEO of Reflect Us, um, I, I'm an international human rights lawyer, and so I started my work in post-apartheid South Africa, and I tell my friends who still do international work that, you know, in, in this country, in the U.S., we have a crisis in our democracy, and that's exactly what this is, in our representative democracy. When you talk about women only holding, let's say, average of 27 percent of elected positions, be it federal, state, local, we're only in 20 high 20 percent and we're 51 percent of the population that's a whole swath of the country that's not being heard and if we were in some other country and if you saw that we'd all be running over there and you know put pouring money into you know programs for women the UN we writing a report well here it is in the US of A and I think what you both have highlighted is really this crisis in our representative democracy so thank you for that right. um, you know, as this session is titled How to Ask a Woman to Run for Office, how, how you know, tell our audience members, how, how would you suggest that they persuade a woman in, in their life that she should run for office? Uh, Mercedes. Sure. Um, well, statistics show time and time again that women, by and large, tend to run for office because they were recruited. Um, but asking a woman to run just isn't enough. There needs to be a little bit of oomph behind that, if you will. Um, and it might take some research on your end if you are do have a woman in your network that you do want to ask. Mm -hmm. So um, something you can look to do is if it's um, if you have a woman who is qualified in your network that you would like to ask to run, um, have you thought about what office she can sh she should consider? You know, would she be best suited best suited for school board, the mayor's office, Congress? Um, you'll be surprised at the differences between uh, the requirements for each of those offices, and knowing what office is right for her is a great place to start. Um, do you know what resources uh, there are that can help, help equip and support her? If not, help her identify one. Be thoughtful on how you would be best at supporting her as well. Uh, will you be available to help her recruit volunteers, knock doors, make phone calls? Um, being proactive, I think, when asking a woman to run is key to a good support system uh, and crucial for any woman candidate that's going to take that on. Awesome, Jean. Any uh, additional thoughts? Well, I think I think Mercedes covered it all, but then you know everything she said is exactly right. And I think that support system is, you know, as she mentioned, incredibly crucial um, for long-term success. That you're not that you're bringing in, you're saying to someone, "I think you would be an excellent resource for our community, an excellent leader. Your perspective is what we need, and here are all the ways I want to help you. And here are the ways that you know our neighbors want to help you. And there's a group of us that are going to do these things." Um, I think that's sort of bringing that that support along with the endorsement or the um, you know invitation is really really important. 
No, that you, you both are, I think, hit the nail right on the head regarding the support and the importance of support. And Jean, you, you know these facts more than I do, but we all we always say anecdotally that you ask a man once or twice to run and he's already, you know, trying to run for like the highest office he can, and that you have to, you know, ask a woman repeatedly to run and you'll get, you know, pushback like I'm not qualified, I'm not there yet. I don't know, Robert's rule of order, whatever it might be. So just seeing the um difference there and the importance of encouraging women in your life and being that support. And I do have to say with the WPLN, um, you're a part of the Reflectors Coalition as is APACS, and I know we work quite closely with COP as well. And so there are resources out there that you can give to the women in your life. Go to the Reflectors website, see our eight member organizations, go to the COP website, um, you know, use those as resources, but definitely support, support, support. Well, fortunately, this is not all doom and gloom. Um, this past election cycle, we did see um, an increase in women running and women getting elected um, in all levels of government. Um, Jean, tell me through the research and the deep research that you all do, what do you think um, was the reason behind this increase in women running? Um, well, I mean, we've seen the last two election cycles, um, the state legislative level and above, we've seen record numbers of women running and record numbers of women winning. So that really, you know, again, speaks to the more women who run, the more women who will win. We know that when, when women run, they win at the same race as men do in comparable races. So, you know, winning is not an issue. It's the numbers, um, the candidates that we really need to get to. Um, but, you know, a lot of this came after the 2016 election is when we really saw the big uptick. And then so the midterms, um, the 2018 election. And we wondered if that would sustain itself in 2020, but it did, which is a good sign um, that if we continue to have the same record numbers of women running, every election cycle will get to parity a lot faster. But I think, you know, there was an upending of the status quo. Um, there was a lot of, you know, there were a lot of factors in the presidential administration, the previous presidential administration that um, women on the Democratic side were particularly inspired in 2018, which is not unusual. The underdog party is usually mo more motivated in midterms. Um, but then in 2020, we saw Republican women respond to, um, you know, the, the sort of the challenges. There were fewer Republican women running in 2018. Um, you know, we lost Republican women in the House, for example. It was a bit of a wake up call, but we saw a lot of uh, Republican women and Republican women's organizations mobilize. And so it's, you know, it's swung in that direction. Um, in 2020. So we also had record numbers of women running. So these are good positive signs um, that if you proceed with intentionality to, to do the recruitment and to do the work, you will get more women to run. I love that. And, and as an and as um, ancillary to that question, what do you think or do you think at all the pandemic has impacted this increase in women running for office? Jean, I'm ahead. Yeah. So, um, when could you could you rephrase that again? Oh, so so COVID nineteen has COVID nineteen. Oh, COVID nineteen. Yes, the pandemic has that had any impact? Do you think on the increase in women that we're seeing running for office? I know. I think you know. Do you think it will? Has it? And do you think going forward it will? Yeah. So we wondered, um, you know, in twenty twenty, if we would see a dip or we would see some sort of impact. At least at the you know the state again the state legislative and congressional levels, it did not. Um, it may have been too early to see that impact um, in that women, in other words, that women were running in 2020, were already planning on running. Right. Um, but what's interesting is I think it has to, it, it can go either way. I think that we, you know, women are facing enormous challenges. Um, they are more likely to have left the labor force in the last year and a half. Um, they are, you know, kids are still not back in school. I mean, in a, you know, in a, right consistent way. I mean, these rolling out challenges. Um, but at the same time, I see women also getting incredibly motivated by the pandemic and what's going on. And, you know, I mean, it's easy to use the schools as an example, but that's one you know, sort of glaring example of um, how policy can really affect day to day life. And um, but also they're watching their communities struggle. They're watching, um, you know, family and friends lose jobs and they are they are motivated to get engaged and help make the policy decisions. So I, I you know, it's one of those like million dollar questions. How will this look in 2022? 
Wow. And, and, and we'll, we'll all be waiting with bated breath to see that. And I think you're absolutely right. I know quite a few women here. I'm in New York City. We had a record number of women running for city council. A lot of them were mothers and they were just fed up with what they yeah. saw with inept leadership. Um, so, so let's see what happens. And, and Mercedes, Jean did talk about right-leaning women and the increase this past election cycle in particular um, of Republican women in Congress in particular. Do you see that trend going up, continuing? And if so, what do you think is behind that? Absolutely. I, you know, Jean talked about from 2016 to 2020, there's been momentous gains um, and women running and winning office. Um, I think that's a testament to um, organizations, particularly on the right, that are trying to close that gap and providing resources to recruit, train and equip uh, women to run for office. Um, when we're talking about COVID um, and the impacts it has on women, yes, Jean is absolutely correct. Um, I think women are unduly burdened by the the pandemic. If you're a, st a single mother and you're trying to work, but also dealing with kids home from school, um, you may find that very motivating to get involved. And that's something that um, personally, I'm very excited to be working for an organization that's working to close that gap and has um, found unique ways to train women during this time so that we don't lose that momentum. Um, and these women are coming to us um, with, uh, you know, policy issue focused, you know, it, it's getting their kids back in school, it's getting economies up and running, it's, mm -hmm. you know, helping small businesses stay, um, you know, vibrant and alive. And so I'm really excited to see how 2020 shakes out. Um, mm -hmm. Because I do think um, my hypothesis is that we will see women that are equipped, trained and ready to go. Um, and that's only going to be um, a benefit for uh, constituents of the U.S. as that means more responsive and inclusive policies um, coming down the pike from women that are leading. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And audience members, please, please feel free to use your chat. We have these two, as I call them, uh, two members of the Brain Trust uh, in this country, two of our leading experts around women's representation and women's political leadership. So please feel free to, uh, to add questions to the chat. Um, Question for you, Mercedes. Um, we talked about the, the successes of, of Republican women, really women, you know, as, as a whole, as Jean talked about, but in particular Republican women this past election cycle. If you could step back and could you tell um, our audience members, what do you think are some of those strategies that women have employed when running for office that have led to success? We talked about, you know, some of the personal barriers that they've had, some of the more systemic barriers that they have. But once they make that decision to run for office, they need the support. We know all of that. But once they actually run for office, what are those strategies that you've seen in your work that have led to success? Absolutely. Um, you know, stepping up to run for office is courageous and not for the faint of heart. Absolutely. I think we can all say that as we've worked in and around politics for several years. Yeah. Um, and I would say this is not just a strategy for women on the right, but for women on the left, too. And that is staying yeah. focused on the policies at hand and providing pragmatic solutions. Yeah. Um, and how you intend to address that. Unfortunately, as a female candidate, you're likely going to be critiqued for what you wear, how you look. I've heard the story a million times from female candidates, and it's simply unfair. But at the end of the day, you are running because you have identified an issue in your community that needs fixed, and you have a plan on how to fix it. And so I really think staying focused on those policies and your solution has been the best strategy um, when de dealing with gender biases. I love that. I love that. And Jean, I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. What are strategies that you've seen in, in Mercedes? You really lifted that up for us. Thank you. Gender biases. What strategies have you seen um, that women have used to combat those gender biases when running for office? Well, you know, um, the Barbara Lee Family Foundation has done some research on um, what voters want to see um, when women candidates encounter sexism on the trail. And, you know, one of the sort of conventional wisdom or one of the, you know, trains of thought had been maybe you just ignore it. Um, you don't call attention to it. But what they actually found is that voters do want the candidates to pay attention to it. They don't want them to respond angrily or get, you know, off on a um, on a path that's not healthy or good. But they want them to be, you know, calm and confident and respond to it, though, and call it out. Um, and I think it also helps to have amplifiers around them calling it out again, respectfully and calmly and confidently and moving forward. They can see her leadership in that. I recognize that this sex, you know, this this bias exists or this. Uh, this newspaper is doing unfair coverage of what I'm wearing all the time, but not my, you know, male opponent, things like that. Um, and so addressing it and then moving on from it um, and sort of demonstrating your leadership has been one very, very effective way in, um, in dealing with bias. 
-hmm. No, I think that's all, you know, so, so on point and so key. Um, Reflect Us, we came out with an issue brief not too long ago um, called Ensuring Success in Office, right? And we talk about that very thing, the, the biases that women face, not just on the campaign trail and sort of we go beyond that, but then once you're in elected office and how the incumbency impacts, you know, who gets, you know, those very um, important um, chairships on different committees, right? And sort of who gets into these important conversations and meetings. And so, you know, I think it is important that you both highlighted that um, running for office is not for the faint of heart, whether you're a man or a woman, and then particularly if you're a woman, and that once you're in office, there are going to be some challenges. But I think, Mercedes, as you as you really eloquently said, um, the the importance of, of our democracy, right, um, leads one to say, hey, we know these challenges are going to be there. Back to groups like WPLN and the great resources that COP does and other groups in the Reflectors Coalition and outside of it, you do have that support you're going to need, but just know and be prepared for, um, for, for those challenges. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, what um, resources would you um, s provide to women? Um, we talked about some of them. Would you suggest that women um, go to who are thinking about running for office or those who are actively running and are facing these barriers? Where where can they get support? Um, well, so we have on our website, I don't know if were you about to say something, Mercedes, or did I? Oh, go ahead, yeah. No, okay. Um, we have a, a resource on our website, um, which I could put the link in the chat, um, but it's a political power map um, under education and training on our website, which is, you know, it lists resources by state. We're actually always adding to it, so people know of resources that they don't see, um, but it's everything from campaign training um, programs for women and for women and men, um, PACs that support women candidates, um, other, organizations for political parity. Um, so that's one way to just get started in terms of if you're trying to tip, you know, dip your toe into the water and look for resources, look for organizations that are working on this issue and things like that. Um, obviously, if you are of a particular party, you're going to want to look for, if you're a Republican, look for Republican organizations and um, vice versa. Um, so that's one way. We also have campaign training programs that we run that are nonpartisan. They're just about the nuts and bolts of running for office called Ready to Run which we host in New Jersey, but we have partners in about 20, 21 other states at this point um, and in Puerto Rico um, to help women run for office. And I know there, I mean, you know, WPLN supports a lot of great um, work on this too. So I mean, which I'm sure Mercedes will tell you about, but there are a lot of terrific organizations that are out there to help women candidates. That's Mercedes, please. Sure. Uh, when it comes to resources, there can never be enough and they will constantly change as challenges change that women face. But um, speaking to w WPLN specifically, uh, we do have a robust curriculum of free online training, video resources and worksheets available to help any woman anywhere in the United States uh, navigate um, elected office. Um, they'll find in those videos that they're able to hone their personal brand, build their team and learn how to run a successful campaign. Um, in addition, we also foster a national online community through our member portal where women can access content, share experiences and ask questions. Um, all this curated with the understanding that women need intentional support before and throughout their political journeys. Uh, and then one of our um, sort of final, uh, you know, third resources that we have available is uh, grant funding to our state partner organizations that really act as our eyes and ears. Um, in a, variety of states. Um, ideally, we'll have one in each state soon. Uh, currently, we're at 11 organizations statewide, mm -hmm. uh, coast to coast, and um, they really do act as um, our ambassadors on the ground that help identify uh, women in their states um, and help address their unique challenges that the women in each state face, recognizing that there's, you know, not a one size fits all uh, curated resource to help women. So we are flexible on, on that end, and uh, we would encourage you to check out um, womenspublicleadership.net to vet through those resources. Um, and we're always happy to chat with you um, individually if you are interested on ways that we can um, sort of get you plugged in um, and prepared to either campaign or help identify someone that you think in your network would be um, a fantastic uh, female candidate. Awesome. And I've been, you know, putting in uh the uh, different websites here as we go along for uh, both uh, WPLN and COP as well. Um, with a few minutes left here, and please, please, audience member, to the extent that there are questions, please jump in here because I can go all day with these ladies. Um, <laughs> but Gene, a question for you. As we talk about the, 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 the numbers and the challenges here, I know you all work nationally and do very deep, deep 
needed in very meaty research. Do you see a difference in representation at the federal versus the local level for women? So we actually, for the first time, did a national study on women in municipal office to get a better sense because the conventional wisdom had been, you know, maybe there's just a lot more women in serving in local councils and um, all that. And, you know, depending on which state you're in, it's there are more women at certain levels than others. But overall, it's uniform across the board. Women hold just about 31 percent of all local seats of so town councils and so on. Um, same with the state legislature nationwide, just about 31%. Um, and, you know, 27% of congressional seats. So it's very similar. Women are under, underrepresented at every level. Um, so there's not a huge difference. Now, state by state, some states are doing far better um, at the local level than they are at the um, federal level or the state legislative level and vice versa. Some are pretty uniform. So really people should look at their individual states. And again, you can find all the facts and you can find um, you know state by state information on our website. And I can again, share more links, but um, so you really have to kind of learn what's going on in my state. What are the resources in my state? And some of this is dependent on resources and networks um, that women have done well um in states where there have been networks and organizations that are there to support them um or where there's been a sort of historical um you know representation level that's higher than in other states so women have tended to do well in the western states for example um than they do on the east coast so or in the southern states so um you know so people really need to find out what the climate is like in their state but the bottom line is women are underrepresented and we need to get more women to run at all levels of office and every level of, of office is really important. We see a lot of attention on congressional um, races and congressional seats and who's serving, but we know, I mean, if the pandemic has taught us nothing, um, you know, it's taught us that local office is so important, you know, community policies and resource networks that we need people in government at local level more, you know, that are really committed to helping their communities. It's so true. I mean, and we say, you know, all politics is local and those are really the policies, the school board, the landing zone, the land use commissions that really impact lives. Um, Mercedes, I see we were about four minutes short, so I'm going to leave the last question with you. Um, what makes you hopeful? Uh, what makes me hopeful is that, you know, I say this all the time and it needs to be said more, but women are not a monolithic voting block. You know, just as there is diversity of thought amongst men, there is the same for women. And I think that, you know, understanding that and taking that in really means that there should be multiple interest points, uh, for women to lead and take on leadership roles. And uh, for me, I'm most excited to, um, you know, find ways that I can be supportive of women to get them engaged, you know, to equip them uh, to build that pipeline and get them to run. Um, and so for me, I, this is just the beginning. I think 2020, like we talked about earlier, um, I have a very positive outlook on. And if there's anyone that can capitalize on, you know, kind of a, a downward turn of events like a pandemic, I think women can. And, um, you know, I, I really am excited for 2020 and I'm looking forward for more women uh, to run, you know, across the board. Love it, love it. And we have about one minute, Jean, if you can tell us what makes you hopeful. <laughs> Oh, we're saying he's doing such a good job. I can't follow that. Um, no, I agree with her. I, you know, a lot of things don't make me hopeful these days, but uh, women's advancement in politics, I feel more hopeful about than I have in a, in a really long time. Um, so we had stagnated in terms of women's representation in the last couple of election cycles. Women came out in force. Um, we still need more of them to launch campaigns, but we saw more women running. We saw women running authentically. Um, you know, they leaned into all, you know, their personal narratives, their personal stories. They didn't try to follow some mold of what we expect from elected officials. So it's very positive that I feel like this generation of kids today are seeing role models. They're seeing and voters, I should say kids and voters are seeing, you know, sort of the status quo upended. And I think that's a very hopeful sign for our future. Love it, love it. Let's end on hope. I love that. So audience members, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, there's hope and there's a reason to be hopeful and there's a reason to get involved and to encourage the women in your lives to get involved. Um, following this session, um, 
this will be our first um, networking break following this session. So to enter the networking session, please click the networking button on the left of your screen and you will be matched with um, our summit participant for one to one video chats. Uh, so hope we'll meet some of you there and we can keep the conversation going. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Mercedes, for your time. Um, as always, it was such a brilliant conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to meet you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.